Good morning and thank you, Janie, for that very warm introduction. And, and Kerry Gardner, co-convener, Fred Grimway, the chair of the Australian Institute of uh, Art History, um, uh, fellow speakers here, distinguished guests, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I, I also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the uh, land of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respects to elders past and present and all Indigenous uh, people present today. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, it's always a necessary time to talk about financial support for the arts, and today's symposium with its theme of global giving allows us to hear uh, many different perspectives. Uh, I've been asked to give a sketch of the Australian arts philanthropy landscape and to provide some context for today's discussions. And I've titled my talk, The Art of Leverage, uh, Co-Mingling Public and Private Funding. I've done so because I often find that international visitors are surprised at how extensive government funding is for the arts, uh, and Australian audiences are often surprised, oh, there we go, does that help? Thank you. And Australian audiences are often surprised at how extensive private sector support is for the arts. So I hope that there's something for everybody in these remarks. The term commingling is used to describe the bringing together of one or more government sources of funding with one or more sources of private sector funding. Australia has a long tradition in the arts of commingling sources of public funding with sources of private funding. The legislative architecture that enshrines government support is pretty effective and efficient and is, and has built, is built on strong institutional and legislative foundations. The government incentives that promote private sector support for the arts are, in the main, generous and appropriate to our system of taxation. Whilst effective, they could be better known and more often utilised. A necessary precondition for the further development of a culture of private sector giving to the arts in Australia is the creation of a more sophisticated culture of asking. Talking about policy settings and administrative arrangements for arts funding so early in the day might present a bit of a challenge. So close your eyes, and I'll put on my glasses, uh, and imagine, if you will, your favourite classical landscape painting in which every rock, tree, or animal is carefully placed to present a harmonious, balanced, and timeless mood. If your mind strayed to expressing this bluntly, you might say that the positioning of every object is entirely contrived in order to achieve the desired effect. So too with public policy. Getting public policy right in the arts matters a lot. The health of the arts sector and the related behaviour of governments, benefactors, corporations and private foundations are greatly influenced by those elements of public policy that shape and nurture the development of a nation's cultural heart. The combination of enlightened government funding and policy, generous benefaction and sponsorship, inspiring institutions and great arts leadership, and the nurturing of creativity itself are the shared responsibilities of a nation. As a culturally ambitious nation, Australia has contrived its own architecture and traditions around how these elements are drawn together, and not surprisingly, they are unique to our geography, to our forms of government, and to the society that we've created. The government piece of funding culture and arts has its antecedents in the pre-Federation days of separate colonies. It's still worth reminding our own population that Australia's cultural journey included the establishment of libraries, museums and picture galleries at times within 25 years of the first European settlement. Today, the Australia Council is the Australian Government's national arts funding and advisory body. Along with the Commonwealth Government's support for the national cultural institutions located in the capital Canberra and the Arts Ministry's own programs, the Australia Council's role is complemented by state and territory governments and by local government at a capital city, metropolitan and regional level. There is a fair bit of government funding strengthening and developing the arts sector. Broadly speaking, the state, territory and local governments tend to be responsible for cultural infrastructure, and the federal government contributes substantially to the funding of artists and arts organisations. 
Federal, state and territory spending on the arts is around $1.4 billion, the majority 68% funded by the states and territories. Local government spending is usually around about 10 or 11%. As the main federal funding body, we at the Australia Council each year deliver more than $200 million in funding for arts organisations and individual artists across the country. The key principles and objectives that underpin public arts policy are enshrined in legislation. On a rainy day, it's worth reviewing those functions and reflecting upon how they define the government's expectations on behalf of the Australian people. They speak of excellence and diversity and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander arts practice, of the promotion of freedom of expression in the arts and community participation, the recognition of significant contributions made by artists and the promotion of the appreciation, knowledge and understanding of the arts, the development of markets and commissioning of research. That is what our Commonwealth Government sets out to do in the arts. The Minister can give certain directions to the Council, but in fact, the legislation protects the independence of the Council's arts funding from Government. While some of this may seem a little off the track at a symposium on global giving, it does explain the circumstances and the background of our own traditions of private sector support. It surprises many that the Australian governments do so much in the arts, both absolutely and <coughs> relatively. And it is an investment well rewarded by its outcomes and by private sector responses. There is enough clear evidence to support the view that Australia has a strong philanthropic tradition, which is often unacknowledged. A good deal of current philanthropic practice is thoughtful, considered and influential. There is now more of it. There are more participants in it, and there is more coming. Even with the current well-designed government incentives, wealthy Australians and Australian corporations commit significantly less of their wealth to philanthropy than do their counterparts in other countries, particularly the United States. As a nation, we do not do justice to our past philanthropic achievements. For a range of historical and cultural reasons, Australians have been less willing to speak openly and publicly about philanthropy than, say, our American cousins. It's probably part of our national character and, frankly, not a bad trait. We dislike self-aggrandisement generally and fear that others may judge us to be getting ahead of ourselves. And what could be more overt than talking about giving away one's wealth? However, this attitude of reticence decreases public discussion about Australian philanthropy. The lack of profile discourages greater giving. The media don't know how to report it and wildly flip-flop between indifference, scepticism and sycophancy. Regretfully, these factors unwittingly and unhelpfully nurture the myth that philanthropy is not typically the Australian way of doing things. Australia has a proud philanthropic tradition that has helped create some of our great educational and cultural institutions. It's also transformed our health and welfare sectors. In the 19th century, the expression of philanthropy from across the whole community was considerable. There was a broad community expectation that support would be given according to one's circumstances. There are numerous examples across metropolitan and regional communities around the nation of gifts and benefactions that occurred to support the building of the nation's infrastructure. There's hardly a gallery, a theatre, a hospital, a church, a community centre, anywhere in the nation that doesn't tell a story of benefaction. Some of the stories are modest in scale and some are substantial. National collective memory in Australia is scant about some of the very significant acts of benefaction that have occurred in our history. This is due in part to state boundaries. Acts of benefaction are little enough known in the states where they occur, let alone across state borders. How many outside of Sydney, for example, would have heard of the power bequest to the University of Sydney and know of the role that it played in giving birth to the Museum of Contemporary Art? How many outside of Adelaide know of the elder bequest or the other great endowments that have given rise to the great collections and teaching resources in that state? Or of the trout support for the Queensland Art Gallery? How many would know even here in Melbourne of the Herald Chair of Fine Arts at Melbourne University established by Sir Keith Murdoch one of the first named chairs in the nation and held today by Janie Anderson. The Felton bequest, even today, 110 years later, remains Australia's landmark philanthropic act. Alfred Felton was the Getty of his day and a true philanthropic outlier. His bequest stipulated that half of the funds were used for charitable purposes in Victoria, 
uh, and half to raise and improve public taste with acquisitions of art for the National Gallery of Victoria, the nation's oldest. The value of his bequest enabled the NGV to regularly outbid the National Gallery in London and the Metropolitan Museum in New York for the best part of five decades last century. In giving emphasis to this historical perspective, I seek to discourage, hopefully even eliminate, a view often expressed here that there has not been a culture of giving in Australia, or that there are no great examples of giving, or that there have been insufficient incentives to give. This denial of our philanthropic history is too common, and it makes a great excuse to not give now. There was a period in our history when competitive philanthropy was rampant and it mattered to be giving support and to be seen to do so. It wasn't just in the US, the tradition was ours too, and Alfred Felton was our Rockefeller, Frick, Morgan and Getty all rolled into one. <laughs> so to today, the lack of mandatory reporting for philanthropic foundations in Australia makes it impossible to give accurate data. But Philanthropy Australia estimates that there are approximately 5,000 philanthropic foundations in Australia, giving between half a billion and one billion dollars per annum across all sectors, not just the arts. I acknowledge that quite a range. The information available on total private support for the arts shows a combined figure for sponsorship and donations. This was 221 million in 2010. Interestingly enough, this had more than doubled in the decade and has continued to grow quite substantially since. Around a quarter of the 221 million in 2010 went to art galleries. A recent study of 12 Australian foundations showed that approximately 11% of their grants supported arts and culture during 2011, most of which went to the performing arts. The commingling of private and public support is our way of doing things, even if it is seldom articulated that way. In the evolution of our model, it's philanthropy that is more often entrepreneurial with a high tolerance for risk, while governments are usually more cautious and risk averse. Philanthropists and trustees of foundations are independent, while governments are responsive to pressures from numerous stakeholders. Given their relative resources, philanthropy's efforts are best directed to startups, while governments are best placed to take projects to scale. Philanthropy is built on deep bottom-up knowledge, innovation, and has long-term horizons, while governments are obliged to take a top-down perspective and are often necessarily short-term and cost-focused. The true art of leverage is to ensure that the work and reach of private sector and government intellectual, cultural, and financial capital can be maximised. For the art gallery sector, that means adequate recurrent funding, investment in cultural infrastructure, incentives to drive private sector support, strong acts of benefaction and sponsorship, inspiring public programs, exhibitions and collections, the appointment of arts leaders, and a continual amplification of the importance of this enterprise to the nation. It also means driving broad recognition for the value of creativity and for the arts, and for the status of the artist in our national identity. One of the key levers that the Commonwealth Government has in driving private support is in its legislative role. Because it pays for philanthropy, it gets to determine what it's paying for. It's responsible for income tax and it's responsible for legislative initiatives for encouraging private support, not just for the arts, but also for charitable giving generally. These initiatives have assisted the recent acceleration in the development of privately funded art galleries and museums, as well as the levels of support to public institutions and all arts organisations. The key elements to our architecture are deductible gift recipient status, which enables organisations to receive income tax deductible gifts and, do and donors to claim tax deductions. In the arts, there is a shorthand way for organisations to join the list of deductible gift recipients through the Register of Cultural Organisations. To be eligible, an organisation must meet several requirements, including that its principal purpose must be the promotion of literature, music, a performing art, a visual art, a craft, design, film, video, television, radio, community arts, Aboriginal arts, or movable cultural heritage. There are currently more than 1,300 organisations listed on the Register of Cultural Organisations. Private ancillary funds are private philanthropic foundations that provide businesses, 
families and individuals the flexibility to start their own trust fund for philanthropic purposes. Private ancillary funds have served to boost philanthropy in Australia considerably. In 2010, just over 26 million, or about 15% of the total distributable funds were directed to cultural organisations. There are now 1,200 private ancillary funds with several billion dollars of philanthropic capacity, and that's growing. Yet there are many in the arts sector that have not yet been able to organise themselves to be eligible to receive the grants and distributions. The Cultural Gifts Program encourages Australians to donate items of cultural significance from private collections to public art galleries, museums, libraries and archives. With objects valued at $45 million donated last year, the total donated since the establishment of the program in 1978 will likely reach over $1 billion by its 40th anniversary. Finally, Creative Partnerships Australia is a national organisation that works with the arts, business and philanthropic sectors as well as government to support sustainable creative industries in Australia. It was established in its current form in 2013 to encourage and facilitate private sector support for the arts and is supported, for the, is supported by the Australian Commonwealth Government. And I am uh, privileged to serve on that board. Through one of its programs, as you might see in, that Janie mentioned, plus one, Creative Partnerships matches dollar for dollar up to $50,000 in funds raised from the private sector. In fact, it's plus one matching program. It's that program that's enabled matching funding for this uh, uh, a symposium to take uh, place. The Australia Cultural Fund, administered by Creative Partnerships, also offers an attractive and successful mechanism for providing tax-deductible do donations to individual artists uh, each year. All of these represent um, uh, the form and function of the co-mingling of government and private support for the arts. The revenue foregone by the Commonwealth Government through the provision of tax deductibility is often overlooked for its value and significance. And the leverage exists in both directions, indeed, every which way. Government leverages private sector support for its own institutions, the support the government gives to other arts organisations establishes the type of financial certainty that's required ahead of private sector participation. The private sector, via its support of arts programmes and projects, institutions and individuals, leverages government through the taxation system. A good example is the State and Commonwealth Government's support through the Australia Council for the major performing arts companies and a wide array of visual arts and craft organisations. It's the certainty of that funding that provides the opportunity for leveraging private support. A healthy ecology can be formed by all these elements combining through powerful partnerships. And we are exploring new ways to leverage off the Council's processes. The long-established, well-designed peer review and grant-making systems employed by the Australia Council provide levels of credibility, transparency and cost efficiency that are beyond the capacity of most foundations and private grant-making bodies. Whilst there will be projects that would always be funded exclusively from public funds, an increasing pool of funding for the arts would ensure that more projects are supported. There are already a number of examples. Australia's representation of the Venice Biennale is an example of a highly successful public-private partnership, and I acknowledge the current leadership of Simon Morton, who's driving this partnership, and also the public-private partnership formed to build the new pavilion. In dance, Carriage Works, the Kia Foundation and Dance House have partnered to present the first major Australian Choreographic Award in 2014. This is the first significant philanthropic award for contemporary dance. The Australia Council's role is to invite an international jury and to commission new works by the finalists. In 2012, leading Aboriginal Australian artist uh, Lena Nyabi was commissioned to create a new site-specific installation for the Musée du Quai Branly Museum's rooftop terrace in Paris. This project came through a partnership between the Australia Council, the Musée du Quai Branly, and the Harold Mitchell Foundation. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Curator Exchange Program is an initiative of the Australia Council and the Harold Mitchell Foundation to support a six-week exchange between collect a, a collecting institution in Australia and the Musée du Quai Branly in Paris. These examples demonstrate some very effective and successful projects where the Australia Council has co-mingled its public funding with private sector support. They pave the way to extend this form of collaboration for the benefit of the arts sector. The development of greater co-mingling requires a shift in the arts sector's culture of asking. 
This needs to be refreshed with greater expressions of clarity around anticipated cultural outcomes, the potential risks and benefits of such support, an understanding of the health, education and community wellbeing impacts, as well as economic benefits and the myriad of other benefits created in a community from support for the arts. The sector too would benefit from understanding more completely the current incentives and programs that exist, as well as some of the motivations cited by art donors, arts donors for their support. A sense that the arts is a valuable cause, a direct connection with the subject matter, a recognition that the recipient project or organisation will benefit the broader community, a sense of obligation or a personal connection with the recipient project or organisation. In conclusion, we have developed and continue to evolve a model for commingling government and private sector support for the arts that's an appropriate marker for a culturally ambitious nation. We have an architecture of legislation, institutions, arts organisations and leadership that can support the nation's ambitions. We have a proud philanthropic heritage and an increasing number of private sector supporters who are enthusiastic and engaged but who need to be mobilised by a more sophisticated conversation with arts organisations. And we have brilliantly creative artists in all, discipl all disciplines creating outstanding work. It's an exciting moment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that passionate overview of Australian philanthropy. I listened um, to all the extraordinary achievements of museums in Australia and the creative culture of curatorship. And occasionally universities were mentioned, such as with the establishment of the Herald Chair and other things. But what, I, I, what one does feel, I mean, once upon a time it used to be a great thing to be a professor of art history in a university. Now I feel it's much more exciting to be a curator or a museum director, uh, being thrust into the critical limelight in, in that particular way. And I suppose um, I thought that universities, in a way, did well in this overview. But um, being, of course, passionate about what I do myself, I was wondering if you might have some perceptions about uh, how we should go about things in universities when um, it is really quite essential to have uh, brilliant young people um, sort of educated and their, their careers expanded in a university environment before they hit um, a curatorship position in a museum. In some countries, like, say, France, um, where they have a professional training for curators like the Ecole de Louvre or something like that, there's a whole new different system of going into museums, which we don't quite have here. And I somehow feel that it would be very interesting to involve universities more in that sort of thing. I wondered if I could ask you for your um, reflections on that. Well, the self-interested question. Thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was entirely without notice, I should say. Um, <laughs> So, look, uh, perhaps two observations. Um, the skills uh, that the world needs now is curatorship. Uh, and I think there are institutions all around the world, particularly in this region, that are really crying out for, for great curators. And that's clearly a great opportunity for the, for the teaching institutions to develop and enhance those skills. And I think there's, uh, uh, you know, looking uh, in, in the next couple of decades, uh, one would anticipate that there will be a demand for that, um, for that level of sophistication in, in the running of, of museums, um, yeah, particularly in our region where they seem to be opening three a week, and we'll hear more about that uh, in the next, uh, yeah, during the course of the day. Um, the second observation that I'd make is the, the research on the arts is woeful. To try and present a picture of the state of the arts in Australia, it's almost embarrassing uh, how you have to go about gathering the information um, like a bowerbird from everywhere to be able to paint a, a picture that actually tells the story of the um, creative contribution that's made, the economic contribution that's made, the number of people that are employed. Um, there are a series of statistics, some of which have been suspended. They have different assumptions. They've changed over time. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a real, it's a real mess. Um, one of the roles of the Australia Council is to try and draw together as much information into one single report that, uh, uh, similar to that that exists in the United States called the State of the Arts Report to give the definitive um, report on an annual basis of what's actually happening in the sector, the contribution that it's, uh, that it's making. But I think there's a, a great opportunity within the, within the universities around research to support and enhance the, the gathering and presentation of, of that. Even some of the statistics that I've used today, um, 
Now, it's really difficult to locate some of those and draw some meaning from them. We hear things like uh, you know, a fabulously successful exhibition at the National Gallery of Australia um, attracting $96.5 million worth of economic benefit to, uh, uh, to Canberra. What a great number, but uh, were we expecting 45, or should it have been 150? Uh, and in any event, um, uh, is anyone gathering them all up so they can make a story? Was it good? W yes, I think it probably was good, but uh, how do we know, and by what, uh, by what standard do we measure that sort, of, uh, uh, that sort of outcome? And if the National Gallery is doing, why isn't everyone doing it, and why don't we have the whole story for the, for the nation? So I, I think that there is a role, again, in universities uh, uh, around that sort of gathering. One of the projects that we've often been considering is working with museums on their collections. And we had preliminary conversations with Ron Radford about this, because what happens in the razzmatazz of an exhibition, extraordinary research happens over conservation, that sort of thing, and it gets totally lost, because the final outproduct of an of a exhibition is only a catalogue, and often conceived and written well before the research is actually done. 